purposes of the agenda. So um, we're not starting in terms of questioning yet, but there's a few aspects in terms of housekeeping which we have to go through first. Um, so the first item on the agenda is welcome and apologies for absence. Um, so far, we've received apologies from Councillor Palace, Councillor Roots, and Councillor Young. And online, we all have Councillor Joseph and Councillor Rathbone. Um, I just want to give, I have to read out some information about the nature of this meeting because it's a hybrid meeting. Um, it's been recorded and live streamed now. Please can all microphones remain muted throughout the meeting in order to kind of prevent any feedback or audio distortion. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand to get my attention. And for those online, the chat function must not be used to have conversations with other participants or to provide personal information as all the chat is recorded due to the fact this is a formal meeting. Please can you only use the chat function to alert me for the fact that you wish to speak, raise points of order or to report technical problems. And we've got wonderful Mario online who will help us resolve anything that does arise. Um, this is a formal meeting. So by virtue of that fact, it means the press may be in attendance or they may later go back to view the recordings of this meeting to possibly um, produce articles for release public in the public. Um, our online councils aren't there as yet, but we're going to continue. Second item on the agenda, urgent items in respect to all your business. There are, oh, Councillor Kennedy, thank you. Chair, yeah, I'm very sorry, I have completely overstepped my mark in terms of uh, your committee, but at the alter ego celebration that's on stage at the moment, I saw the artistic director of the Hackney Empire, Yamin Chowdhury, um, and said, would he like to come um, and give some evidence to you tonight? And he said he could. At some point between five past and quarter past seven, he can give us about 10, 15 minutes before he has to go back to do the, the farewell speech. If that works with you, entirely in your hands, uh, Chair, um, sorry. In terms of timing, I'm just going to put it to Commission members, whether they find that acceptable, or respect to our approach and schedule for this evening. Do we need to vote on it? Councillor Garber, do you want to? I was just going to say, as long as it gives everyone the time to, yeah, present, I think that's, yeah, yeah. be interesting to hear. I think we don't want it to detract from the people who have formally, but thank you very much for that, Councillor Kennedy. Um, that would have been an urgent item, thank you. Um, agenda item three, declarations of interest. I do have one by virtue of the fact my daughter attends Hackney Shed and they will be in attendance this evening. I think we've got Vicky Hambly from Hackney Shed here. Um, that's mine. Anybody else have any? Thank you, Lucy. Um, in the past, my son attended Hackney Shed. <laughs> Doesn't anymore. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so on to the main agenda item of the, on the agenda. Equality, diversity and inclusion in the arts and the cultural sector. This item is scheduled for no longer than one hour and 40 minutes. And the Living in Hackney Scrutiny Commission is keen to hear about the barriers faced by underrepresented groups in accessing arts and cultural opportunities in Hackney and the work of the council and its partners to improve equality of access and increase participation. Inequality of access to arts and cultural services appears consistently as a challenge for the sector. And the Commission sees the discussion as timely given the inequalities and barriers that have been brought to the spotlight as a result of the pandemic and cost of living crisis. The aim of the session is to understand the local inequalities of access to arts and culture services and how best the barriers to access, both for the audience and the workforce, can be overcome. The Commission will be assisted in its discussions today by contributions from Hackney Council's culture team, as well as two and now three of our local arts and cultural organisations, Hackney Shed, Play Space and the Hackney Empire. Oh, sorry, thank you. John Moore Generation as well. We have Saul, thank you for being physically with us this evening. Thank you. Um, 
So in terms of the council attending for this meeting, we have Councillor Chris Kennedy, Cabinet Member for Health, Adult Social Care, Voluntary Sector and Culture. Thank you. Polly Chup. Oh, there she is. She's online, yes. Yeah. Strategic Director of Engagement, Culture and Organisational Development online. Lucy McMenemy, Cultural Development Manager with us in person. In terms of play space, we've got play space, we've got Catherine Mengarden online, thank you. Hackney Shed, we've got Vicky Hambly, thank you. Jumbo Generation, we've got Cindy Ma and Tan Luong. Am I saying it correctly? Cindy Ma, thank you. And Tan Luong, thank you, in person with us. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all this evening. And I'd also like to invite Lucy initially and Polly and Councillor Kennedy to give a brief presentation to supplement the written submission received in advance of this meeting. We'll have a total of up to 10 minutes, all inclusive, if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so please feel free when you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, so the paper, I'm just going to give a very brief summary of the paper that was submitted, which um, focused on two questions, how underrepresented communities are supported to take advantage of opportunities to participate in arts and cultural activities, and what barriers remain in engaging unrepresented groups. Uh, so just as a bit of background, um, uh, the paper touched on the fact that the cultural development team is tasked with delivering the Council's arts and cultural strategy. Um, there was further context in the paper about key characteristics of Hackney's population, and it noted that um, it's particularly diverse and is um, relatively young. Um, the paper mentioned two reports um, that identify current issues relating to underrepresentation in arts and cultural activities and opportunities. The first is a social and economic impact report on the Hackney Carnival, which was undertaken in 2019. Hackney Carnival is regarded as the borough's biggest and most inclusive cultural event, and the report aimed to tell us who really accesses the carnival and also to indicate those who are less well represented. Um, the report suggested that while Hackney Carnival attracts people of all ages, abilities, ethnicities, sexualities and backgrounds, there are lower participation rates amongst certain groups, which include um, Haredi Jewish communities, Muslim, Turkish, Kurdish communities, Asian and Asian British communities and disabled people. The second report mentioned was the panic report, um, the social class, taste and inequalities in the creative industries commissioned by Create London. And that report focuses on the lack of diversity in the cultural workforce. Um, although access to the workforce is not the main focus of this session, it's worth mentioning as part of the bigger picture about equalities in the sector. And this, uh, that report was the findings of that report were echoed in another um, by the Arts Council in 2017 called Equality, Diversity and the Creative Case. Um, it's just worth mentioning also that in March this year, a new direction will publish um, a report on arts in schools. Um, which will be a follow-on report from um, a report of the same name published 40 years ago by the Calusa Gulf Banking Foundation. And it's also worth mentioning, um, let's create uh, the um, Arts Council's 10-year strategy for arts and culture. Uh, one of those investment principles is about inclusivity and relevance and the importance of making work that is relevant. So uh, the paper just out very briefly outlines what the barriers to participation are and, um, and the work that we currently do to overcome them. The first barrier is financial, um, and there's cost barriers for the public in terms of entrance fees and ticket prices, but there's also cost barriers to those organizations that are creating culture, and they need to find ongoing revenue to, and project costs to deliver activities um, at affordable prices for audiences and participants. There's also cost barriers in accessing training and higher education for anyone wanting to enter the cultural and creative industries. Uh, so there's a list of the things that we do in the paper, which I won't go into because we haven't got time right now. Um, the next barrier um, that we talk about here is physical. Um, there are a wide variety of physical barriers experienced by disabled people and others with limited mobility, but this also relates to access to buildings for all involved in cultural delivery. Again, there are various strategies that we, that we have uh, that we implement to um, address this. Digital barriers exist and cultural services and organisations made great strides in putting their content online during the pandemic. Um, and that led to new audiences and also made 
um, maintained it for groups vulnerable to COVID. However, the Cornerstones of Culture report tells us that 6% of households do not have access to the internet at home. Um, and those more at risk of digital, digital exclusion um, include older citizens, the most financially vulnerable, those not working, people living alone, and people impacted by a living, uh, limiting condition, um, such as hearing and vision impairment. So the paper goes on to address certain strategies that we have for making sure that we reach people who are not digitally connected. There's also a perception barrier. If residents can't find people from their own community represented in a cultural activity, uh, a venue, an art form or a management team, they may believe that that cultural activity is not for them. In addition, what we regard as universal activities may be inaccessible to certain groups. Um, Understanding those barrier, these barriers takes time and they're unique in each case. Um, and um, again, we've listed in the paper various strategies we, we have to date. And then a barrier to accessing a creative education is the final one. Um, and should, we need to say that Hackney Music Service and Hackney Museum are both embedded in local education and have years of successfully working with the borough schools. Uh, the cultural development team um, has delivered occasional um, engagement activities in schools and we know that a more strategic role is required from us to broker relationships between BCS cultural organisations and the borough schools. Um, the rest of the paper really um, gives um, some examples of um, projects that uh, create access and break down, attempt to break down some of the barriers mentioned above. Um, and the final bit of the paper is about remaining barriers um, and the kind of work that we might need to, to undertake to overcome them. Perhaps we'll talk more about those in this session. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Kennedy, did you want to add to that at all? Um, I think I'll reserve my right to speak later because I'd like to welcome Yamin Chowdhury um, to the chamber right on cue. <laughs> um, you can sit anywhere you like. <laughs> um, uh, and so we understand that you've got to leave so sort of now. We'll, we'll let you speak. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I would love to get back to the Hackney Empire to close off my event, if I may. Um, but I'm really happy to be here uh, for the duration, if necessary. OK. So you're, you're closing there. OK, thank you. Do you want to just pri provide a brief overview of what you've been doing? Okay, yes, I would love quickly. to. OK, thank you. I would love to. The stimulus for today's conversation is remind me, please, if somebody may. Um, we're talking about how you successfully overcome barriers to participation in the arts. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, and I really wanted you to be able to talk about everything you've done um, and everything that the empire has done, particularly through the lens of, for example, what's going on tonight. Absolutely, very happy to. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, for those of you that um, I haven't met, my name is Yamin Chaudhry. I'm the artistic director and joint chief executive at Hackney Empire. Um, I have I initially engaged with Hackney Empire. Somebody will cut me off if I go on too long. I hope. Um, I initially engaged with Hackney Empire in the early 2000s um, as a young offender. I grew up in Tottenham um, and was lucky enough to have some people around me who showed an interest in, in my future. Um, and it was a very unique set of, uh, it was luck, it was luck that brought me to Hackney Empire's door and Hackney Empire engaged with me in a way that no organisation has before or since really. Um, at 18 years old, I'd never been to a theatre before, and I met Susie McKenna. And Susie McKenna was about to become the creative director at Hackney Empire. And Susie came to understand that I'd never been to a theatre before, and she invited me in to watch a show. And I went in and watched a show from behind the sound desk. And at the end of the event, Hoffman, the technical manager then and now, said, same time, same place tomorrow. And for the next three months, I sat next to Hoff, and I watched and learned about theatre, this kind of mysterious thing. And it changed my life. That one summer in 2002, I believe it was, changed my life and informed the practice that 
I've tried to bring to organizations like Hack Me Empire ever since. So I was, uh, I went off and, and built a career for myself and I was asked to come back to Hackney Empire in 2011, uh, at which point they were rebuilding their youth kind of facing work um, in the build up to the Olympics. And what became very, very clear was that Hackney Empire was doing incredible intensive work with a very small group of people who found it very, very valuable. But was not really being utilized in the wider scale. And I think that's so true of arts and culture kind of as a sector. It's, it can be impenetrable, depending on how you grow up and where you grow up and what you look like and where you come from or what God you worship. It's, it, all of these things kind of factor into our engagement and the potential barriers to participation that we may face. And so it became very, very clear that in order for us to really reflect the needs and desires of the young community in East London, they had to be central to the devising and development of the creative process that informed holistically the decisions we made as an organization. And so that's what we did. We centered, we knew that we had this incredible heritage and legacy, um, this renown for being an organization that had historically been much more open than the wider sector. But there was more that we could do and there's more that we can always do. And so it was, it was at that point that we began to develop a new process and way of working that centered audiences, communities, participants in every single decision that was made and not focusing on participation as a byproduct of artistic or strategic or operational decisions but actually making them the founding kind of architecture of the decision-making process. And it's revolutionized the work that we've been able to do in that way. And uh, the, the data kind of really backs that up. So we went from working with 50 young people per annum in 2011 to five and a half thousand in 2014. Um, and that sounds quite grand for us to say, but it was developed by the participants its success was built on the very people it was trying to reach and ensuring that they had a non-tokenistic ownership over every single decision that was made. And then that made us think differently about how we work with our audiences in a wider capacity. Um, and so the main stage work, both a received and produced program, began to more and more reflect our young people's work, which is kind of the opposite of, of generally how it works. <clears throat> but what became very clear was that there was an incredible learning opportunity, um, a microcosm in many ways in, in how we delivered our young people's work to how we wanted our organization to be seen in the widest possible context. Um, now I'm incredibly... We're going to have to, because I know you have to leave I'm going to wrap I know up. people probably want to have put some questions of course, to you. Of course, of course. It's kind of wound up and I, I, thank you. I have wound. You have wound. Thank you. All the way. Thank <laughs> you very much. Um, for me, it was interesting hearing about the work that you're doing and the increase with respect to participation of young people across the board. Saying that in terms of that process, are they at every tier of decision making? And also in terms of embedding employment opportunities, further afield, is that part and parcel of the process of the work that you're doing in Hackney Empire at the moment? Yes, so they're not embedded at every level because we haven't found a good way of creating a youth board yet. And we don't want it to be tokenistic. The whole point is that we do everything meaningfully. So we're, we're still developing the strategy to have that most senior level of leadership um, um, and, and how young people facilitate that. So not at every level, but everywhere else. Um, and this your second question, oh, uh, employment opportunities. So yes, so a part of every single project budget is um, we set aside money specifically for young people to train in employment so that they're paid practitioners in every single project we deliver. We deliver 48 weeks of the year. Um, all of our programs are absolutely free, um, both at Hackney Empire in external organizations and in schools, uh, which is again removing another barrier to participation. So that's one manifestation of that. The other is that we don't see ourselves as a, as a full stop or an end point for our young people. We are absolutely a nexus and hub to signpost to further 
um, opportunities away from Hackney Empire and actually outside of Hackney. Part of our remit is to make sure that our young people from East London are also exploring what the capital has to offer in its widest sense and the incredible organisations that exist in every corner. So, um, yeah, it's something that we are, we're very proud of. And if commission members have any questions that they've got, well, it might just be me again then. So in terms of the partnership work with the local authority Hackney, of course, how how easy do you find that relationship? Is it, are, there, are there any signs of barriers in terms of you further developing the work that you're doing at the moment? Or is it just kind of... Mm -hmm. All, all lovely. This is a stitch up, yeah, isn't it? it is, how, how many ways can I answer this question? No, for me personally, I've always found it incredibly easy. Um, colleagues like Chris and like Lucy and Petra and Olga and, and that their teams, Cherie and everybody, um, Emma, have been so incredibly supportive of the work that we do at Hackney Empire to the extent where actually in various ways uh, people like Pauline and Alice Deacon we've actually been able to signpost other organizations smaller grassroots more hyper local organizations that don't necessarily have that um, connectivity um, with the council to, in order to enable their next steps. So I'm incredibly grateful uh, for the relationship that Hackney Empire and, and the London Borough of Hackney have. I do think that it's the onus is on us as partner organisations or suppliers for the council and on the council to ensure that our reach is as broad as possible because there are amazing organisations across the borough who are really struggling now more than ever. And I know I don't have to say it, but I think it's often difficult for them to voice that themselves and and so certainly it's within our remit to amplify that um, but perhaps more can be done to ensure that we are not overlooking incredibly important but smaller organizations on communities doorsteps across boroughs like Hackney and the wider uh, boroughs across East London. Thank you Councillor Ogunde Moran. Yeah hi um, yeah thanks for your um words um my question is um hackney has seen quite a shift in terms of its ethnic diversity through gentrification so um what do you think we can do to remove the barriers in terms of those that are participating in the arts but also those that are consuming the arts with the gentrification that's happening um thank you for that question i don't think gentrification has done anything to make barriers to participation in Largen. It's just made those divisions that already existed more obvious. So when, you know, when I was growing up and, and Hackney certainly looked and felt like a more vulnerable borough than it does now, um, it, the same people were engaging with arts and culture as an offer 20 years ago as they are now. Very few strides have been made in terms of the diversification of the, the you know the genetic pool of people that feel privileged and able to access arts and culture i think it's about how we talk about arts and culture and the value systems that we uphold as enablers and gatekeepers and by we i mean organizations like hackney empire but also the council um, in terms of making people understand that arts and culture exists in their dining rooms already every time they turn on the radio every time they watch the tv it's not just when you go to the ballet it's not just when you go to the opera and we we approach these discussions from such a predisposition of judgment um that it's it makes it even more obtuse in terms of what these offers are. Um, I also think that more has to be done to develop yellow brick roads for audiences into theatres like Hackney Empire um, and theatres across the country. This is not a Hackney specific thing. We just feel it more because of the incredible, wonderful depth of diversity within our borough. Um, but really, this is a marketing and communications exercise. How are we talking about what we do? and why are only certain communities feeling like that enables them to buy a ticket that's that's the fundamental failure of the sector for 50 years 60 years you know we're doing the best that we can but we need better people more people to inform the decisions that organizations are making um, in that respect it's slow progress but it's progress nonetheless 
Councillor Sedek, we're going to have to make this the last one because yeah, we're going to have it, to move on. Thank you. It's, it's a very quick one. It's a follow up on, on that point. That being the case about the nature of the communities that consume arts and culture the most, is it in terms of increasing participation and, and helping people from different backgrounds, diverse backgrounds, come into pursue employment opportunities in arts and culture? Is that very difficult to do, or you know, impossible, or um, without changing the interaction on the consumption side? Or are you having success, and other organisations having success to some degree, regardless? I mean, it's a difficult value proposition because the arts and culture sector. A lot of parents don't want their kids to get into arts and culture, and I find it hard to disagree. It's not the most stable lifestyle. And particularly where you, your background is a more marginalized, a more isolated, a more vulnerable community, the amount of um, uh, risk that you can kind of levy at the beginning stages of your life, not your career, your life, reduce by factors every single time. And it's where education and class and culture and race intersect to create this set of um, barriers. And of course, you look across theatres theater, across the country, look across film, TV, music, you're not going to see huge amounts of diversity. It's, the, it's a homogenous monolith, and that hasn't changed for a long time. But there are small changes, and there are organisations that are working incredibly hard um, to make it feel more possible and to demonstrate real tangible manifestation of change. Um, but I really do believe it starts with education and ensuring that we as a community are really, really underlying the importance of storytelling, be it in journalism or be it on stage. Um, and as arts and culture gets stripped and stripped more and more out of the curriculum, that becomes more and more difficult again. So it's a, it's, it's a, now a different set of obstacles that are appearing and particularly for young dancers it's incredibly difficult at the minute in areas like Hackney and Haringey where I'm from um, to engage in that in that next set of skills um, but you know uh, exposure is crucial and Chris Thank you, Chris, has whispered um, that I should also just say that Hackney Council um, and the Hackney Together Fund and Hackney Empire have enabled, will create opportunities for us to engage over 6,000 young people with their first experience of the transformative effects of arts and culture, uh, where the tickets are absolutely free. So we're giving every single one of the 1,200 seats in Hackney Empire away to 14 year, to 18 year olds to have their first experience of theatre. And we piloted it last year um, in February or March, I believe, with Battersea Arts Centre's Frankenstein, How to Make a Monster by the Battersea Arts Centre Beatbox Academy. And it was uh, for the evening, the room was filled with 1,200 teenagers who had no idea that theatre looked or sounded like this. And there were a couple of, you know, mainstream establishment types who were questioning, is this theatre in the first place? And I think that's the responsibility that we all have to take. Theatre, arts and culture is what we want it to be and is as uh, valuable as we need it to be. Thank you so much for giving up some time, even though you've got to rush back to the Hackney Empire. It was a it's great pleasure. Hearing about the work you're doing, you know, and as you've highlighted, I think particularly in respect to the arts, socioeconomic circumstances, as well as you know, eth ethnicity, are often barriers to both access and progression throughout the industry. So it's good just to kind of learn about what you're doing. I hope we may have some more questions which we may need to kind of put to the empire and write and just get further into Absolutely. that into um work that you do just to feed and inform our kind of whatever we can process. do to support thank, thank you, you so much, much for having me okay thank you very much take care okay uh, a slight deviation from what we're going to do but thank you thank you as insightful so now we're just going to move to the structure that we had in place before um so we're going to give each of our organisations a few minutes to introduce themselves and the work that they're currently doing in our borough. Um, so as you're in the room first, we'll go to Junmo, just if you could give us an insight into what you're doing, you know, potentially, you know, 
how long you've been operating for, any obstacles you face, and generally a sense of how you see your organization moving forward. Thank you. Um, hi, Cindy. Cindy from General Generations. Um, we're an uh, organization that um, promotes Eastern Asian arts, and we've been part of Carnival since the 80s. So it's been quite a while <laughs> trying to influence Asian arts. Um, the Asian community has existed in Hackney for many years. So looking at the Vietnamese community, um, Chinese community, and looking at how it's evolved. Um, I think it's deteriorated over the years, I feel. Um, I think in the past, uh, in the 80s, they did used to have yearly Chinese New Year events every year at Hackney Town Hall, right outside on the steps. And I think when it came into the 90s, it stopped. Um, and then in 2000, a lot of the Chinese community centres, like the Hackney Chinese Community Centre locally, um, never took part in any arts at all. So um, their involvement in the arts and culture has been very minimal. Um, and um involving being part of it has been very difficult for them due to the lack of um support that's been happening in the 90s of helping them through um changes um as myself growing up in hackney um growing up in stone <laughs> um and educated in Hackney. Um, I felt that that was a loss. But I've grown up in Hackney for so many years, being in an artistic family, surrounded by artists. So I had chances <laughs> to make a difference. So that's why I took Carnival, took us into Carnival. So we attended Hackney Carnival. We attended Notting Hill Carnival. And we built a name. We won loads of events, won loads of trophies, costumes. And I said, well, don't turn around and tell me that arts has to be purely just Asian traditional arts. You can actually evolve and become combined arts um, and interpret designs of Asian arts into the whole entire event and win, still be part of it. So trying to teach this on to the communities has been very difficult, like, just like what um, Joel was saying, um, getting them to understand how um, they can interpret the art in many forms and getting them to understand that it doesn't necessarily have to be pure, it has to be Asian or it has to be black or it has to be, um, I don't I just feel that they, they're not realising the diverse community now and they have to evolve and engage more and be enlightened more by the differences that communities are very connected. Um, and that's what I'm always arguing all these years. So recently we did the Lunar Chinese New Year at Hackney Wick, which was really successful. And we got all the schools all involved in making scales uh, all the children, elderly, community centres, even from Turkish community. Uh, we went to um, Vietnamese community and we did lots of things all around Caribbean community. And they all took part in making this dragon. And although it's an Asian earth dragon, they all made this happen. Um, so it was exhibited at this Lunar New Year. And I think, you know, the main thing that we, we've tried working with Lucy, <laughs> we've put Kennedy in as well. <laughs> um, and um, it was last minute, but it can happen. What I'm just saying that is that if I wasn't given an opportunity by Lucy to turn around and said, let's do it. I don't think that, and for Kennedy to just jump in last minute and say, I'm going to be there. I don't think that this event would have been successful. And what I'm just trying to say is that 
although we try and distinguish that there are communities that can't be reached, I think it's that they don't realise that it doesn't have to be purely just about their culture. It doesn't have to be just about their morals and how they interpret it. Can that be a mixture of different cultures still come together to be part of the event? I mean, you might think that, oh, Chinese New Year is just for Chinese. It's, it's not. It's for everybody. I mean, look at Carnival. It's not just for the Black community. It's for everybody. It's a celebration. And I think that's what I find needs to be clarified a bit more. Um, although I do understand that there is that, um, there's, there's this moral and this tradition that it has to be remembered because it's, there's the history there. But I feel that by doing that, you neglect certain communities, certain groups of people, because they don't feel that they are part of it. And I think that direction is really important because I've grown up with Hackney. I didn't, I don't know anyone in China. I moved from a mixed community. All my families are mixed race. All my sisters and siblings have mixed children. And you think, well, how can you turn around and say that when I'm here and I'm still trying to be part of it? So I'm sure there's a lot of people just like me that feel the same. You can't define where you belong but you want to be part of it and i think this is where i see how um maybe the way that we're going forward in the strategy how we're taking ourselves there is a different century now different community now and everyone's mixed race and you have to overcome that you know we, we're all amongst very mixed wide range of um cultures um, but you can't def make the person define if they were Chinese, if they were Black, if they were Asian, if they were... It doesn't matter. And, and that's what I'm trying to emphasise here, the importance of trying to feel belonging. Um, but then you'll turn around and say, no, you've got to decide where do you stand? Um, and I don't think that they should. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for right. that <laughs> broad introduction. Thank you. We're right. going to move on to the other two organisations. We're just going to give us a brief um, Thank you. overview of what they do, and then we'll be putting questions both to Councillor Kennedy and officers as well as yourself. Thank you. If we can hear from Vicky Hambling from Hackney Shed next, please. You may be muted, Vicky. Okay, yeah, we'll, go, we'll move to Catherine and we'll come back to you, Vicky. You can go to Catherine from Play Space. Uh, hi there. I'm um, happy to. Uh, hi, Vicky, as well. Um, can you hear me? Great. Um, well, thank you very much for, for having me tonight. Uh, so I'm here um, as, as PlaySpace and uh, I've been uh, very uh, lucky to work with Hackney Council over the last year and a bit on a number of projects. So very much the work that I've been doing has been very project-based and funding-based from that perspective. One of them is uh, Hackney Young Voices, where I worked with a primary school, a secondary school and an adventure playground in Hackney to come up with uh, designs for billboards uh, that were showcased across Hackney in the summer and were seen um, by over 200,000 people, which is fantastic. And the, the point of this project was really to validate and value the children's own creativity where, they, where it actually is. Because I think that's, uh, I, I completely agree with what was said earlier about the, the key points about education and putting art and culture at the heart of it. I think we, we are really suffering from um, this narrowing that's that of really pushing it the the art out of it so that the project itself was very a very sort of very short intervention of only six hours um over a number of weeks within each establishment to get them to come up to this project but it was really all about making it very child centric and really giving them a sense that that, that not just the sense but actually putting them at the heart of the delivery and what they created was really really stunning uh, so that was one of the first projects that we did um 
I was also involved, um, I also work with the Shakespeare Walk Adventure Playgrounds, where we run some of the activity for Discover Young Hackney, running a number of workshops which were aimed at the sort of the 11 plus community, giving them access to uh, skateboarding, to uh, SCN sort of sessions as well. So things which were uh, culturally relevant and maybe not necessarily um, adventure playgrounds typically try to offer a very open rather than led journey. And I think we were sort of trying to sort of show the value of doing that. And we know that had a, a great impact. And another project that I was involved in last year was with the Tower Theatre um, in terms of uh, as a, as a non-professional theatre, they've been creating fantastic, um, they've got a program of, of plays every year, but what they've really struggled with is engaging a younger audience. So the idea was to really look at what we could do to engage these young people into engaging with the theatre. And so what we did there was create a series of workshop, a course, uh, but instead of being just about performing, we decided to open it about anything to do with the, all the jobs and careers that are around theatre and for the sort of the 15 plus age as well. So this course is currently ongoing. It's going very well and it's been a really fantastic way of um, through all these projects to understand the what, to showcase what we know is an issue, which is that divorce between um, young people who need to have access to things, but also these places that really want to give this access, and yet somehow they don't seem to find each other. And um, certainly with what I've been discussing with Lucy and with the council over the last few weeks and months is how do we find a way to, to bridge this gap? So uh, that's that's the sort of thing that um, that I've been sort of involved in. Um, my work is very much focused on how we bring culture into schools within the current system without having to change it by showing that small interventions can have a massive impact. Thank you, Catherine. Um, again, we've got to take many um, questions after all of you have presented. Vicky, are you? Can you hear us? Are you able to um, give us an overview of Hackney Shed? We can. Oh, great. Okay. You need to put the volume up a little bit, I think, though, if you can. Let me try. Hold on. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry about that. I needed to get some headphones in in order to make this work. Um, uh, so my name is Vicki Hambly, and I'm the Artistic and Strategic Director of Hackney Shed. Uh, we are an inclusive theatre company that works with young people in Hackney um, between the ages of around seven and 25. Um, and for us, our main thing is that we really focus um, where we can on removing barriers to access. Um, this started off, we've been going for since 2001, this started off primarily as a focus on trying to make sure that the um, uh, the programs were accessible to young people with um, special education special educational needs, disabilities, neurodiversities, but really this has branched out into a, a much larger um, uh, definition of access for us. And we try to just, no matter what someone's personal circumstances are, if there's barriers for them coming to the programs, then we try to find ways of removing those barriers. Um, so that might be because someone uh, is not able to financially contribute and we um, only uh, operate on a donation only basis. Uh, so nobody is refused entry if they can't uh, if they can't afford our suggested donations. Um, we also are heavily staffed so that we can make sure that we're already putting in place the support that might be required for anyone who might require extra support. So that kind of stuff is put in regardless, not an afterthought, that stuff is put in in advance um, for anyone who may require that. Um, it's also about having a real variety of projects because some families can't commit to regular projects. Um, they might need something that is uh, more of a drop-in or a shorter term project or something that happens on a weekend or something that happens in the holidays um, and then some families uh, and young people really uh, want that committed project where they're they're coming every week um, so we we try to offer that uh, variety we also try to work with a variety of partners in the in the community so that we're using different venues because we don't have our own venue so it means that we're trying to reach different parts of the borough by working in different venues which therefore then bring 
different young people um, and families to our uh, programs. Um, that's sort of a brief overview, if that's what we're looking for at this point, if that's helpful. Very helpful, thank you, Vicky. Um, so now, yeah, we're gonna to move to questions. And I'm gonna put Sarah's question forward first. I'd, I'd like to thank um, Lucy for the thorough report that you presented commission members with. But within that, it just throws up in my head, I am, I am somebody who loves data. So in terms of us as an authority assessing both value for money and effectiveness, effectiveness of the projects that we fund, how do we do that? What does it look like? Do we produce any kind of statistical data at all in terms of outcomes, uh, you know, as a means of us being able to state that this has had a, a kind of significant impact in, in terms of the communities that have accessed it, in terms of diversity and social socioeconomic backgrounds, or, yeah, what does that look like? And on the flip side of that as well, I'd like to know from the, our organisations, both here and online, what positive outcomes would look for them. So in terms of me being focused on stats, is that irrelevant in terms of your own per personal points of view? Is it more about whether it's large or small numbers, their own the experience that they have in terms of personal development and enrichment? Am I all wrong? I like numbers, I like stats. Am I all wrong? Thank you. Um, so, for example, the, the uh, project that Yamen's been running all week, um, Alter Ego, um, while you could take some stats from that, actually, if you go tomorrow night and see the show at the Empire and see the, the young people performing, the uh, those young people look like the young people we see on the streets of Hackney. When I was at the Mayor's Music Awards um, two weeks ago um, at the Empire, the bands that were playing looked like the young people I see on the streets of Hackney. When I go to, um, and this is a definite change, when I go and perform my duties as an, the Council Observer on the, the board of the Hackney Empire, uh, the board members now look like the people who walk down the street in Hackney. When I first attended 10 years ago, they didn't. They were all old and white like me. Uh, they're not anymore. Um, and it, it, it's uh, 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 rather than the actual specific data that I know Lucy is going to talk about, I just wanted to talk about uh, certainly in the performing art, some of the visual data tell, gives you some of the answers um, that you want to see. Um, by the same token, um, when I go to um, Panto with my family and look at the audience, the audience looks a lot whiter than the people on the streets. The cast on the stage doesn't, which is brilliant, but the audience does. And so, you know, there is, an, and Yamin referenced that, didn't he, as he was talking to us. So there's, there, there is still um, uh, work to do in terms of um, engagement um, uh, with, uh, audiences um, and I think the free ticket thing is part of uh, helping that but also that's a that's a cost of living um, thing and that's a and, and he's betraying a much broader social malaise that we know exists. Thank you Councillor Kennedy. Thank you so with um, our large projects, we will always have an evaluation framework that we set up at the start so that we know what we're aiming to deliver, what success looks like, and how we're going to measure that. And so um, we'll, um, so for instance, with the Hackney Carnival, um, there's a there's a long list of aims for each of the, for every time we deliver the carnival, and we'll um, work with stakeholders to decide what the aims what the what the aims should be and what success looks like um, and so we'll have a report with um, quantitative data which will be the outputs in how many events happened how many workshops took place how many people took part how many artists performed etc and then we'll also have qualitative um, feedback from participants and audiences and stakeholders which really reflect um, the, out, the outcomes of the event, you know, what of, or of the project, what difference did it make to the lives of the people who took part? So that's that's what we currently do with our large projects. Um, 
I know that you were interested in um, benchmarking with other boroughs, and um, that's something we we could do more of. Um, we don't do a great deal of that, but um, you know, there's definitely scope for us to do more of that. Thank you. Well, so as well as the kind of big ticket items, is is that process of evaluation applicable to the smaller projects that we're still able to fund? I know there's, there's been limited funding available, again, as a result of government funding cuts, um, but is, is that same process applicable to them? And I mean, this is the question I was putting to them as well. Likewise, do they feel that that sort of review is in line with the whole kind of principle of what it is they're providing the community with? Is, is, is that in itself a barrier to people accessing funding? Is what I'm trying to say as well. But yeah, back to the initial question. So with smaller scale funding as well, the same process applies in terms of review. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, ideally every project will have that evaluation framework in, in place. Um, it, it depends kind of on the circumstances sometimes, you know, if we're quickly turning something around because we have an opportunity to do something, we might be evaluating it afterwards rather than having that in, in place at the beginning. But the ideal scenario is that it's a well-planned framework from what go. Thank you. I don't, I don't know whether um, any of... Okay, we've got Vicky Hamley from Hackney Shed. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was going to say just in response to what you um, had mentioned, like, you know, does anybody uh, care about the numbers? Is it just you? Um, and I am what I would say is that um, a lot of people care about the numbers, whether it's important to our participants or not. So it's um, about always having to make sure that you put those things in place. And we do measure those outcomes. And it's good for us to be able to reflect. But I think the most important thing is is that I think for some organizations, like you were saying, um, they may not have uh, the knowledge of how to do those measurements, and that might be a barrier for a smaller organization who doesn't know um, how to how to find those numbers. And those numbers are often essential for funding. So if you are um, a smaller organization who's not used to collecting data or knowing how to frame it and uh, so that your your participants are answering questions that are actually getting you the uh, data that you're trying to measure. I mean, a, like a lot of that, I think, can be a barrier for organizations that um, are inexperienced in in doing that. I know when I first started out having to do measurement, um, it took me time. Like it took me a while to work out actually how to do it properly, and it you know. The council is actually very good now. The CDH, CDS offers free courses and stuff like that. Sometimes I've seen them advertised, but when I was starting out doing it, that wasn't an option. So it was like trying to find money to pay for a course to learn how to do that measurement. Um, so I think things like that in place to help smaller organizations understand how important that is, because it doesn't feel important when you're doing the work at that point. What, what you're wanting to do is deliver the work. And so some people don't realize that that is such an essential point and such an essential part of being able to deliver the work because you can't get any funding for it otherwise, is what I was going to say. Thank you, Vicky. We've got Catherine next to respond. Um, it, it's a build really on what Vicky says. I completely agree with what, what you said. And my experience has been also that, um, so for example, with um, Shakespeare Walk Adventure Playground, they've, they've built a music studio in there. And they've got a brilliant play worker who is also a DJ and producer himself. And so we've, we've worked to applying for some funding from youth music. But frankly, had we not sort of mentioned it, he would not have tried it himself because he feels like it's beyond his capacity. That's not what he does. He's a music producer. So doing these things is really difficult. And even if they are courses, they might simply not see that it's for them. And so some people miss out on these opportunities simply for the, that, that disconnect, which I think is at the heart of so many of the issues. Um, of, of the people, the practitioners, but also the young people or the people who might benefit from the activity that they think it's just not for them. And I think that's what we need to try to sort of crack. Thank you. I don't know whether John Moore Generation wants to respond at all. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, Councillor Garbett. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for your contributions. It's been really like valuable to hear what all the great work you do um it kind of build my question kind of builds on that and from some of the contributions that we've already heard and i wanted to 
I wanted to get to, to an understanding from the council's perspective about how the people that we're trying to reach are included in the decision making and the development of some of the schemes that we've got. And then maybe reflections from the organisations about how the council could help in the kind of comms piece that we've heard about in making sure that people feel included in the arts. So kind of similar but slightly different angled questions. So um, is that question really about sort of co-production and how well we'll do that closely with given communities? Um, so to give the Hackney Carnival as another example, um, we, de we develop and the Hackney Carnival very closely with um, the um, many carnival groups in Hackney. We meet regularly throughout the planning process and ensure that the direction that the event's going and you know reflects the interests and ambitions of everybody involved. Um, for the Windrush program this year, we put a call out to the community um, for ideas for how we can celebrate the 75th anniversary um, of, of um, Windrush arriving in London. So um, there are, you know, there are different ways that we can do this, but we definitely, the, those are always the best projects. If we can really co-produce with the people that we want to engage, that's the, 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 we get the best outcomes for sure. Councillor Kennedy. And I just build on that. So like at our time of crisis, as it were, after we had to cancel the carnival last year, it was with um, all the participants that we actually put together the programme that then subsequently allowed everyone um, to showpiece the work. Um, and actually showpiecing the Earth Dragon was was part of that, was kind of like the, the, the final piece in the jigsaw of showing um, all the amazing work that people have done during the year. But the, um, I went to the, the first meeting of the steering group, um, so about 10 days after uh, the Queen had died, so about eight days after we'd cancelled Carnival, um, expecting everyone to have a real go at me. And I just said, look, really sorry, but I think we had to do it. And um, I'm the cabinet member and please blame me. Um, uh, but I'm here to ask um, how you think we can showcase the work. And no one piled in on me. Everyone started going, oh, well, why don't we do this? We could try that. We could. Um, and actually, when you actually go to people and people are used to you listening to them and hearing their ideas and their um, uh, suggestions about the way work should be done, um, then they're not in that, you know, blame, have a go culture. They're in the right, uh, what can we do? Uh, let's make it happen, um, frame of mind. And I, uh, I put the reaction then down to the fact that we've been working with them for a year on how the carnival would work. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. We've got Polly Chuck. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. So just to make sort of the broader point around what um, Councillor Kennedy and Lucy have been saying, I think that what's really key to our approach to managing culture and cultural development, Hackney, is that we very much like to use culture as an engagement tool. Um, and, 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 and that works in both directions. So we use, we try to use culture as a way of engaging communities that we might find it harder to reach. Um, and then in turn, that allows us to build trust so that we can engage those communities on wider issues. And um, and that's been a um, something that's really come through in the work that, um, that Petra's led with the, with the Windrush elders, because um, older um, African Caribbean people are an audience that the council hasn't always found it easy to have a dialogue with. And establishing the trust through the Windrush Cultural Programme has meant that we've been able to go back and talk to those residents about other issues. It, for example, having that relationship in place meant that during COVID, we could engage with those residents around issues like vaccine hesitancy and COVID testing and all those things that we needed to be able to do in a pandemic situation. The cultural programme have put relationships in place which continue to pay dividends. And um, and also we can also use cultural events as way as ways to have conversations with 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 wider audiences about the issues we need to talk to them about so you know i'll always remember we had a very you know um when we were having the dalston conversation which a big place-based conversation about the future of dalston we took that conversation to carnival because people were out and about in dalston and and, and used that cultural event to engage with them on those wider conversations about place so that link between culture 
and community engagement is absolutely at the heart of the way we operate in Hackney and I think that's really precious and I think it's it has um, borne great dividends. Um, piece of work we've done recently, um, one of our communities that are most challenging I think sometimes to work with is our Haredi Orthodox Jewish community because they're not a community that will participate in wider cultural events like Carnival. Um, but Lucy recently um, led a piece of work in which we helped work with the Hackney Empire to facilitate a very large scale performance of Haredi girls in the Empire, which had been an extremely logistically challenging event for the Empire to manage in the past because of the sheer number of people involved in it. And we were able to help by opening up parts of the town hall, providing you know, lots and lots, you know, providing sort of, you know, DBS checks of female chaperones from our teams to help out, um, you know, allowing the use of the car park, all kinds of practical logistical things that enabled those girls to take part in arts and culture, which isn't something that's widely available to them. And that, in a way, is something that's not going to, with that community in particular, tie into those wider objectives of bringing people from different backgrounds together, because that's not the way it works. But what it does mean is that we've built some really trusted relationships there, which means that we'll be able, able to engage women and young people in that community around wider issues more easily in the future. So that's just a kind of um, that, that that's just a kind of overview of, of how it all fits together. But that, that's the approach we're, we're trying to take with it all. Thank you, Polly. Um, it's, yeah, it's just another question that sprung to mind, particularly in respect of cultural engagement. I think while the work on the Windrush, obviously that's been taken with the Heredi, Heredi community, as well as the Lunar New Year, deserves and is worthy of praise. There are, there are swathes of other members of the community who don't ever experience anything like that at all and don't see themselves represented in our cultural offers. So, I mean, you've put under representation at Hackney Carnival, but within what we fund, is there any analysis of underrepresentation amid those, pools, those, pots, those, those kind of projects that we have funded? And what are we also doing to tackle that? I mean, I say that um, as in terms of black residents, people of African heritage make up a significant portion of the black community in Hackney, but don't necessarily see themselves reflected in what we do across the board. Although we may say that they, they are part of the Windrush work on Windrush generation. They don't necessarily see themselves reflected in that, with it more having a Caribbean focus for many people. I mean, you may see the odd picture in the library of somebody in traditional dress, but other than that, culturally, from what I've seen, there's been nothing kind of specifically put forward. I could be wrong. I could be wrong specifically for that community. And I'm sure there's other communities across the borough who experience the same in terms of cultural isolation or a lack of engagement. Um, I can see Polly's got her hand up. I think Polly's going to answer that one. Thank you. Um, so first of all, you are wrong, but you're also right in the sense that there has been a lot of work done to um, sort of celebrate and, 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 and to and, and to do work with African communities in Hackney Museum. Um, so for example, Hackney Museum have done big exhibitions about um, African residents in Hackney and their heritage and culture. Where you're right is that the very fact that you didn't know about that shows where we're going wrong. Because actually, um, I think that one place, you know, one thing that we haven't always been brilliant at in the past is, um, is really publicizing the work that we do to all the people that need to know about it and um what i mean what i'm trying to do in bringing together libraries heritage and culture into one kind of service area within the council is to provide that kind of critical mass that will allow that incredible inclusive work that hackney museum for example have been doing for years to reach a wider audience so um and we know that, you know, and Lucy and Petra and I have sort of torn our hair out over this many times over the years. We know that we don't always get the bums on seats, to use a crude theatre term, that we ought to be getting at these events. Um, and what we've tried to do is um, is create a structure that gives um, more kind of targeted marketing support. So we've created a role um, specifically to do marketing and outreach across the library's heritage and culture portfolio and we've just recruited to that role from actually from within the library service um, so that's about to kind of come into place and the other thing that we've done is we've created a role 
which is a more senior role which will be responsible for outreach with young people and schools right across the library's heritage and culture portfolio so those jobs will be there those people will be in post very soon and that's to give that really focused effort on not just putting on these fabulous things but making sure that people know about them um and you know because the corporate communications team supports where it can but it's spread very thin across the whole council so by putting some really really focused effort in there i really hope that the kind of that brilliant work um will, will be able to come to the fore and also on libraries one of the things we're really keen to do is turn libraries into cultural and engagement hubs so we have a library in every community in hackney you know we've got um we've got eight libraries nobody lives more than a mile away from a library in the whole borough and turning those into really rich hubs for cultural events and engagement events i think will pay dividends because you know where people might not want to come into the town hall or they might not want to go to the other side of hackney everybody can walk down the road to their library and take part in something so i think that's a really kind of that that will really help us in the future as well okay thank you polly Councillor ogun Demuran, thank you very much i'd like to yeah thank everybody for their um contributions now i think we can all agree we are for equality, diversity and inclusion and growing up, I was all about yeah, equality, but the older I, I've become and the more social, sociably aware I've become, I think we kind of need a rethink in terms of equality and actually replacing that with equity. So what my question is, is what can we be doing as a borough and as a council to make sure the consumption of the arts and participation in the arts is equitable. An example, an analogy I can give is like, if you're hosting an event and you're providing food to the event, you can provide food for everybody. But a way of making it equitable is asking for dietary requirements. So making sure you're catering, you're catering towards everybody's dietary requirements. So bringing that back to the consumption of the arts and participation in the art, what do you think we can do? Vicky, thank you. Hi, um, I feel uh, very similarly to what you, you've been talking about. And I feel like this comes up a lot with us when we have funding proposals because the because we work a lot with young people with uh, special educational needs and neurodiversities and the extra cost of disability that comes in uh, both for the family and for providing services in that and for someone uh, with disabilities or neurodiversities. And I think that there needs to be a more standard um, recognition from uh, organizations that like um, access, like I know this sounds really like basic, but access and certain parts of access should be separate parts of your budget line and that and that those access things need to be recognized as above and beyond when you're putting things together for funding applications because a, a young an organization that is putting in an application for working with young people that is not putting a whole bunch of things in place for access and is asking for 10 grand is totally different from an organization that is asking um like if we're asking for 10 grand we, at, and we're putting in all those access things we're actually not able to provide as much in terms of services and i feel like those kinds of things being separated or acknowledged that you, that it costs more money to make things accessible and to make things equitable it costs more money that is a fact and that you have to be able to show where like you have to recognize those costs and that um I think that being able to recognize that in both funding applications, but also just for your own organizational self, by putting that in in your acts in your budget, you start to realize that when you make things more inclusive, you have to spend more money. And I think that it's it's just it's just a fact a lot of the time. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of projects become unaccessible is because when people are short of money, it's the first thing to get cut. And people think about um, they think about trying to make things accessible in ways that are only obvious. And this is where the diversity of the people involved in making decisions makes sense too, because you only think about what you yourself need at any given event and or um, 
project that you're running, which is why it's so important to consult with the young people or sorry, not I'm saying young people because we work with young people, the people that you're working with and the communities that you're working with, because I may not have the same access needs or, or needs for a project that someone else does. And we need to know what those is and put them into your budget before you even start the planning. Because if you don't, then what that means is when someone turns up and says, I can't come in less this, then it means they can't come because you haven't thought about it beforehand. And I think that it's just really important that as an organization, it is, it is our responsibility to make sure that we're putting those things in place, which do cost money and time, which is also money, <laughs> but um, that we have to have those things in place beforehand and we have to have those discussions so that the onus is not on the person coming to those events to be like, oh, it turns out I'm not actually welcome here. You've said everyone's welcome, but I've turned up and actually I can't, I can't really access this event. And I think that's what's really um, important to me and important to how we try to run. And of course, you're going to get it wrong sometimes, but you, to, to try to, to run it that way. Thank you, Vicky. And I, I, in my follow on to your response, I think it's for officers, so in terms of accessibility and ensuring as many people as possible can attend and have access to the, the projects that we are funding, how is that factored into the funding that they're provided with? Uh, okay, Hackney Shed, I know, has wide-scale accessibility in respect to people with disabilities, likewise socio-economic circumstances, and any reduction in funding therefore will have a detrimental impact in terms of the numbers that can attend and the numbers of people who are there to support them. So I just, yeah, I just like to know how much does this factor into how we fund them? Uh, I wouldn't want it to be a case of organizations left out in the wind, you know, once, even though I appreciate this financial situation affecting us all at the moment, I just want to know how this factors in into our approach as an authority. Um, so when the culture team um, uh, allocates Grant funding, we ask for applications that include details of any access requirements and a budget line for that. Um, I should say that with our own projects that we deliver, we're always learning um, about how to make um, uh, you know, events and um, activities more accessible and, and uh, our, our line for access is always growing uh, because we learn as we go along. So it's, you know, it's something that um, uh, you know, we, we know we need to learn more about um, in partnership with the organisations we work with. Okay, Councillor Sadek. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so my question is um, on a slightly different note, and it's quite a general one. Uh, something I didn't pick up from the, the documents that I looked up for the meeting, uh, and this may be part because I'm a new councillor, it's just useful to hear this. Um, I'm wondering if, if you can give me both council representatives and perhaps those from outside organisations that are here, a sense of just an, a, the collective health of arts and uh, culture organisations or the sector in the borough and the sort of things that I'm thinking about are, I've just made a quick note of here, sort of the number of organisations that are participating in the sector is that an upward trend or a downward trend over the last few years, the number of people that are participating in, in those organizations activities is that going up or is that going down how's the financial security of these organizations how many of them rely on volunteers and you know the number of volunteers go moving in a positive direction or negative direction um, do they have access to space at an affordable rate do they is there a growing demand for cheaper or free um space like there are in other parts of the sort of sector across the borough are there new organizations in this space that are coming in to, to offer new services if not is that a concern um, and i suppose taking all those things into account the overall picture how does how does the council plan to um reflect any needs that arise from that in the new strategy that you're developing i think you're developing at the moment thank you Okay, so that's for each of the organisations as well to respond to. Councillors first. Okay, a general health check on them. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, because I've worked closely with the carnival groups, I'm I'm aware of a um, 
a constant urgent need for workspace and um and we're always trying to find um solutions to that and um in 2022 we we were lucky enough to have um um two organizations coming forward to offer us space for carnival artists which was fantastic um so it was autograph and hackney bridge um allowed carnival artists to go in and make their work um or to, or to rehearse in their spaces and that was that was brilliant and that's a, a model that we'll look at in the future as well because um that partnership seemed to work well for those organizations as well as the artists um but yes it's an ongoing perennial issue we do need more workspace um and um it's something that the culture team mentions when we um, can see that there's sort of development opportunities coming up that we can feed into we'll say is there any opportunity for um creative workspace to be included that can be used at an affordable rate or for, or for free by certain groups in the uh, that we work with so yeah it's a really relevant question that's okay maybe um i think you also wanted to understand how certainly recent cost of living and inflationary pressures um had affected the sector and we we do have um, regular updates um, and catch-ups with them and uh, some organizations are surviving better than others some so for example um, I saw Ben earlier um, from Circus Space and Circus Space didn't get their continued national portfolio organization funding from the Arts Council and they're going through the voluntary redundancy process at the moment and he's not looking forward to the next few months when he has to face the possibility of compulsory redundancy process um, and uh, generally speaking um, think of it what you will about the Arts Council um, uh, emphasis and the rationale for them taking their decisions but uh, money moved away from London and the South East um, we did relatively well in terms of our organizations um, in fact autograph got national portfolio organization status for the first time so uh, there were some immediate winners for us in Hackney but I think overall yes it feels like the sector um, uh, is uh, under more pressure at the moment that perhaps than it has been for quite a long time I think that's fair enough to say isn't it I can just follow on from that because we've been meeting with um, organizations over the last few months to just sort of check in with them on how they're coping. Um, and um, we've got feedback from theatres and cinemas who've been particularly keen to meet with us, telling us that um, family audiences are spending less money. So they're, they're, they've got less income um, from those kinds of shows. Um, that's because families seem to be most immediately hit by the cost of living crisis. Um, food and beverage costs are rising and organisations are absorbing those costs rather than passing them on to customers, but there's only so long they can do that for. Um, there's um, a slight impact on hires, we'll see how that goes. Um, there's a huge concern about heating bills um, and um, some organisations are still struggling to find a provider as well. Um, some organisations have been supporting their um, uh, participants um, who are hungry young people are coming to workshops hungry and so that the, the focus of those events are about feeding those young people as much as the creative activity um the, yeah some organizations are saying that ticket buying audiences are much less keen to try something new or or to go to something that's a little bit challenging it's harder to tell to sell tickets for something that's an, an emerging or unknown act um it's much harder to program because funding outcomes are so much more uncertain often organizations are having to apply more than once to get the funding that they need to deliver a project and so there's a huge risk for a theater for instance to program in um, a company that doesn't yet have its funding in place uh, so it just makes it very very complicated um, deferred costs during the pandemic are now being asked to be paid, um, which um, you know, is, is a huge challenge for those organizations. There's been a knock-on effect of strikes, particularly transport strikes, and uh, recruitment is a big issue um, for cultural organizations at entry level, as there are fewer people in the market at the moment. Well, go ahead, Councillor Sade, and then Councillor Darbeck. 
Thanks. Yeah, it's just, it's just a quick follow up. Those answers um, really helpful. I suppose focus focus um, primarily on the su the supply side, the health of the organisations that provide these opportunities to people. Do you, is, do you are you able to give a general sense on the other side and sort of the demand side um, of people wanting to both participate in arts and culture in the borough and consume them? Is is that sort of just a, a constant healthy demand? There are obviously things that we can do. Um, to increase participation or to increase consumption, but is that generally in a good state? Is it moving in, in a positive direction or is it difficult to, to engage people just to have a sense of things on that side? Perfect space. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Catherine, did you want to respond to that question? I just wanted to make um, a contribution of an example, really, of um, what I've sort of observed while working with schools um, in the borough is um, you see that schools have a need for arts and culture, even if it's diminished in so many ways, there is still a need to sort of fulfill, for example, visits to theatres or visits to museums and things like that. And what I find quite uh, marked is the fact that they often have to leave the borough or they feel like they don't have they don't necessarily know about the initiatives within the borough. So you will have theatre trips to the Old Vic, which is lovely. But when we have such fantastic theatre in the borough, why is that not more of a destination? And I think it's partly a question of um, it's a complex question. Uh, partly because there is a curriculum requirement is, is the top priority for these schools and ease. So organizations such as the Old Vic or the Globe will be able to have something in place that is just not simply available to put in place for small organizations where we are. But I think there's also a, a lack of awareness of what is available here or making that link between the two. That's and that's I could say that it's probably more an anecdotal rather than sort of based on any data. Um, but that's that's what I've observed. And so um, I think there's definitely a an appetite, but I think a lot of people post COVID as well find themselves um, almost pelted with so much information and you don't really know what to do. And that, a lot of people sort of retreat a bit still from that. That's my impression. So, could I, I've got a direct answer to that, Catherine, which is um, I, I remember asking my children's primary school this very question. It's like, it was why are we dragging them all to the way the nat to the Natural History Museum when there's all this stuff to be done in East London? And their answer was that actually a lot of these kids, if they don't go with the school, they'll never go there. They'll never go to the other side of London. They'll never go to the South Bank. They'll never go to the Natural History Museum. So it's almost a conscious thing to broaden the to broaden the horizons of the kids in the school who won't necessarily be taken to those places. So there's a good argument for that as well as a good argument for staying locally. So anyway, sorry about that, Chair. I just thought I'd come in and answer that one. <laughs> Thank you, Polly. I'll return it to Council to the next question in terms of supply and demand. Are we seeing higher demands for excuse me, services such as your own? Um, likewise, Hackney Shed and Hackney Space. And are you able to accommodate that, that demand? Go ahead, Vicky. Um, I would say our <clears throat> demand is pretty steady um it we've got a uh we usually have waiting lists uh for most of our groups that has stayed the same they, they they sort of uh really grew over the pandemic because we didn't really have anyone leave during the pandemic uh because i think there weren't as many things on offer and so they got really really long and now they're starting to get back to like what we would normally have as our waiting list the problem that we have is that we um we do rely on volunteers um, and staff, that, uh, st you know, freelancers that are often starting in their careers, and that has become a challenge for us. So the demand is still there, but we are struggling in that um, uh, we have less volunteers than we normally would, um, but also our programs are growing, uh, so we we're, we need more volunteers than we normally would. Uh, and also we you know, train up young people. Actually, when Yaman was talking about the fact that they work with other people to have 
their young producers working at, in other organizations. We work with Hackney Empire and young people who come up through their program will sometimes come, come and be facilitators with us starting out. But because we're so small, we can't offer full-time jobs to people. And so we start training people up and then they can't afford to be freelancing at loads of different places. And then they will go into teacher training or they'll go into something, they'll, they'll, they'll mostly leave the sector. Um, so we're struggling right now to find ways of, you know, maintaining a young and diverse staff that require more than what we can offer them in terms of work. Um, and so that's where some of our problem is coming. But the, the, the amount of young people that are interested in what we're doing, um, the numbers have, have been pretty steady throughout. Thank you. Go ahead, Catherine. Um, again, another build. I, I, I agree with, with what you're saying, Vicky. I think the what can happen with some organisations is to say to see volunteering as an extra strain as well, because it's great to sort of think about bringing volunteers, but if you're quite small yourself and you have to look after and train these people, it has a cost, and it's not something that a lot of organisations can actually take on. So I think there's often a reluctance to engage with that because it's not seen as something that's going to support in the shorter term because it's going to be an, an extra an extra cost really so i think volunteering is a difficult thing from that perspective too thank you i don't know whether john Moore generation wants to come in on that in terms of demand for your kind of provision and what that looks like and the impact on you and whether you're able to accommodate it or demand is definitely there because we've done quite a few things in schools in quite a few schools in Hackney and the demand is there to require some education in different cultural uh, arts um, and, and the head teachers want it they want lots more um, but as artists we can't provide as much um, professionals or trained uh, volunteers to to come and support every class um, if you think about you know one year group has probably like two to three classes so if you were to fulfill the project within two weeks how many can you do in that one school not to talk about other schools that really want the same thing happen, happening in their school too um, because they need that uh, extra bit of education uh, and link with culture uh, and culture and arts is a lacking in, in the school curriculum right now, which is required. Um, well, it's required by lots of families. It's, it's raised an awareness how it can help with mental health as well as uh, development in learning. Um, like there are children that have dyslexia and they, they learn things totally differently and not arts cover that kind of area. So the demand is very high, um, but as organisations apply for funding, there is a lack of facility to see into that kind of field and say, well, we want to put a funding in to, to cover the access to provide this opportunity to the schools. And these are schools that really need some sort of culture they said um and helping them through that it, it's been difficult because funding access has been very low in those areas and i think it needs extra support in that side um plus the volunteers to come on board which are like trainers they're coming in to want to to help teach or they want to help uh like i said being the carnival group we've got lots of volunteers but they need also their time paid to come into the school and do the work um so there is there is lots that is required but how how do we get around this as well with funding thank you it's just a respect to the volunteers are you finding that you're having to rely on them more so than in previous years and does that have an impact in terms of the stability of your organization i think that will go to all three of you so thank you do you want to go first in these um, we're, we're having to rely a lot more on Lucy uh, and the funding and, and we, we ask it, is that available? Can we go ahead and do it? And this, this Lorna project, which we did recently, we had to do work with two schools, which was um, in Hackney Wick. 
and um, they they really wanted more and we could only provide only two workshops and that two workshops only covered for two classrooms for just one hour so um i think we're relying on coming back to hackney council and saying well applying for funding in such short notice um with big funders like arts council was proving to be too difficult it wouldn't fulfill it wouldn't have fulfilled anything within a month from christmas to the chinese new year which is in january so there was no way of, and people don't want to do anything during the christmas time so you know luckily if it wasn't for the cultural section here i don't think anything would have happened in any of these two schools so you know i think that like I said, the demand needs to grow in that. I'm relying more on the team in, in Hackney to, to, to come up with these ideas and work with us and see how we can do this instead of saying no to the school. <laughs> That's a brilliant story. I think particularly in, in respect of the way that the council stepped in as well to provide that kind of immediate funding where, where there was a shortfall. Um, that being said, in terms of our relationship, this is what officers, in terms of our relationships with schools, okay, I think it's kind of highlighted that their exp expectations of schools don't necessarily align with the kind of format and structures of the organisations providing services for them. In terms of meeting those, kind of having a meeting of mind in that respect, is there any ongoing work in terms of the development of partnerships which as well as profiling organizations such as Hackney Shared or Hackney Space or Young I would get it correctly, sorry, Junmo Generation. Is that now part and parcel of the work we're doing or is that an ongoing piece of work? Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Um, uh, don't forget the bit that Lucy uh, put in the paper about we've still got that really good ongoing relationship with um, the museum. We've got the new um, officer starting, recruited into your team um, and um, putting it as delicately as possible. We have a more um, positive and interactive approach from the education service than perhaps we might have had in the past um, uh, to help embed um, culture in our schools. And don't forget, we've got the school's music service and one of the wonderful things about um, two weeks ago and the Mayor's Music Awards was seeing, for example, one of our primaries, um, uh, Berger, winning uh, a Mayor's Award because they'd used their access to that and, and uh, some of their own funding to make sure every child in the school got an opportunity to play a musical instrument. There is, there's, it, uh, it really does feel like there's still really good engagement. Um, um, uh, obviously more to be done and that's why you've got the, uh, uh, do you want to say a bit more about the officer? post coming in yeah so the new officer post will um sit in libraries but will work across libraries heritage and culture um to broker those relationships between schools and bcs cultural organizations and and our own projects and events um so we're all really looking forward to them starting they can pick up on things like discovering hackney as well which will which is our youth arts festival which aims to engage young people in um creative activities with our brilliant um cultural sector so they can find out about ongoing opportunities to engage and and find out about pathways to future training and potentially careers um, so um, yeah, so there's there's more capacity coming because we know that that's something that we um, are kind of under delivering on at the moment in terms of the cultural strategy. It's one of the strands of education and, and um, you know, developing um, those strong relationships between schools and the cultural sector is, is a key part of the cultural strategy. And, and so this new role will will deliver on that. Oh, sorry, so I get that in terms of the bigger picture, but also in terms of local brokerage with the multiplicity of organisations that we've got on stream already, that will be part and parcel of this process. So, school, so I'm trying, uh, of course, we don't know exactly how it's going to look, but I'm just trying to get a feel for it. Yeah. So schools, schools will have access to cultural services, say they've got a need for something, and you'll be able to identify somebody within borough as opposed to having to go elsewhere. Is this the sort of thing that will be happening in the mid that and you'll be able to refer them on? Yes, absolutely. And um, of course, the cultural development team who have the relationships with the boroughs, arts and cultural organisations will, will work really closely with that post holder so that we can feed in information about, you know, um, 
uh, kind of best matches, perhaps, if you like, between different schools and different organisations. Very much. But Councillor Garbett. Yeah, my question kind of goes back to one of the questions we had earlier about um, cost and the kind of rising cost and that being a barrier. And this is building on conversations as a Dalston councillor. I've been speaking to people in um, Gillette Square and around Dalston. And some of the, so the thing about Gillette Square and making that a really safe, family friendly space, lots of people say that having events there, like the police have said this and the council have said this, that having events there will kind of make that a thriving space which we all agree is is kind of really important but what the organizer you know what the small grassroots people in that space that want to put on events say is really difficult it's not just the cost of putting on the event but it's the kind of periphery cost you know like the enforcement costs and cleaning costs and putting on getting the toilet there and stuff like that and it sometimes stops people putting events on so i just wondered if that's a consideration from the council in terms of making those costs you know because sometimes they're just putting on a small event sometimes it's just a photography exhibition or a music thing but sometimes those costs can make it make it really difficult yeah it's a, it is really expensive to do an event outdoors <laughs> and there's there's not much getting around that really because as you say you have to have all of the um sort of safety and enforcement um things in place um so I don't really have an answer in, in terms of how we can help to make that more affordable, um, apart from kind of working in partnership with organisations so that, you know, they become part of a bigger event, potentially. We, we did that when we were programming in Dalston Square years ago. We'd bring together organisations who wanted to do something in Dalston outdoors and we would, they would do it under our umbrella with all of our planning in place. Um, you know, that's, that's one way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that they do feed that back that being part of kind of wider groups and those infrastructure groups that can help facilitate some of that. You know, if they've just got a really good idea and they're part of the community that's in that space and know that it, it will really work for the community, it's kind of how we provide that yeah infrastructure for them to do that. Yeah, thank you. But Cindy from Fillmore Generation wants to come in. Um, I know that's probably the subject that you've came across already, Lucy. But I think uh, as an organisation, I think the biggest thing was that Patney Council has a community halls team. And this community halls team, I mean, we've been renting for them for years. And when it came to um, linking up with the cultural events that are linked, very closely linked with Patney Council and the local events and big events are going on, there is no substance or any discounts because you're actually doing a project for Hackney Council. Um, they, I think that the community halls team make it difficult for groups, arts groups, voluntary groups, youth groups to provide more for the community. Uh, even like I said, during COVID time, uh, community needed something even like providing food, they literally wanted to charge all volunteers, the rental of the hall, the access of the hall, um, a, a place for elderly to come in and collect any uh, equipment or safety equipment. It was, I just feel that a connection needs to be made with the community halls team, which is under Huntley Council. I feel that something needs to be put in place to communicate and make this easier for all arts groups, youth groups, community groups, charity groups to access in some way. Of course, I'm sure there's rules that you may want to put in place that they had to abide by or follow. But I think something needs to be done because I think they're treating all youth groups, voluntary groups, community groups, just like a private organization. And with me, on the front line, constantly having to deal with it. It's been hard work. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. We've got Councillor Kennedy who wants to come in on that. Um, yes, and it's just to say, uh, yes, sorry, Cindy, you are absolutely right. Um, fortunately, um, the mayor and uh, senior uh, officers are aware of this, um, uh, and there is work going on to work out how properly we use the assets that we own as a council and that doesn't just include our community halls but includes buildings um, out of which we might deliver services or buildings which we might own including 
um, in our property service sector about how we make them work. Um, not always with a make them pay for themselves, but how how we make them pay for the things that we want uh, to see happen for our residents, um, especially our residents who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to carry out those activities there. So uh, work is in hand. Um, and we are aware that it's a fault that we have sometimes with our buildings, especially our community halls. Brilliant questions indeed. Lovely response. Councillor Kennedy. We've got um, Councillor Sadek who wants to come in next. I heard a hand go up. Okay, no. Councillor Sadek, go ahead. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this question for Lucy. Um, in the report you gave, there was a reference um, on a page number. It's on page three. Just to the, the the use of the culture team's budget and the fact that most of it goes on Hackney Carnival, um, we've been hearing about lots of the stuff that your team does this evening. That it's beyond Hackney Carnival. It sounds like there's lots of it, and it's clearly very valuable and helpful to organisations across the borough. I just wondered if that um, if there's plan to reconsider that. If there's value in spending less of the budget on the carnival and allocating money to, to other things, what position on that is or whether that's set to continue given that that is such a um, brilliant and as you say inclusive event that people across the borough love so is your question um could we use the budget differently yeah um well it it sort of depends on what we want to achieve with the with the carnival in any given year really uh, so it, it has to start with that before we can um reallocate the funding if you see what i mean well the carnival um is an expensive project to do and uh, so um you know we have to start with with that and, and make a decision about what we're going to do with carnival in any given year before we know whether there's you know what funding we have for other projects if you see what i mean yeah. We look at everything in the round, of course. We know that we're not just going to deliver carnival. That, that's not the only purpose of our team. Um, so um, it's it's a political decision as much as an officer decision, you know, more of a political decision really about how much we might allocate in any given year to to um, the carnival, in fact. Yeah. That's indeed, yeah, um, I, I'd just like to add that actually, I think what it is, it's carnival is, is kind of a big word and it's confusing. But if you look at carnival, carnival is made up of groups, youth groups, community groups, arts groups, all around Hackney. And we come together to make carnival happen. So it could be mental health, it could be dancers, it could be photographers, it could be costume makers, designers, schools, coming together to produce pieces of work to take to carnival. So although carnival is a big word, it isn't about just people just coming out on the road and just dancing. It's, um, it's all the groups that are coming together, doing work in schools, uh, providing all these pieces, building all these pieces, like we did build this thing with six different schools and we put it together and we bring that out to Carnival. So it's, it's a lot bigger than just the word Carnival. Uh, we spend um, the whole spring in the school doing workshops and then through the summer, we open summer schools and we do loads of projects in the schools um, as volunteers going in doing things with the community, doing things with libraries, dealing with providing local residents and tenants to be involved. So although carnival is a big word, everyone is very involved. So although you bring up the question saying, is this money only for carnival? It isn't. It isn't just the word carnival. It covers all the groups, all the groups that are all surrounding around Hackney that form this whole big event. They have to show it off somewhere. They can't just do it 
behind closed doors. They want to show it off. And that's why Carnival, the word, was so big. So there are more to it. So although Carnival never happened because of uh, the Queen that passed away, all the, um, the things that were happening behind the scenes, in the schools, in the dis dis disabled people, mental health people, uh, those that couldn't speak English, we worked with Turkish, Jewish, we worked with all different people. They couldn't come out, but they were very upset. A lot of them have never been to Carnival. They don't know what Carnival is, but they're coming out to share what they made. And, and that's bigger than the word Carnival on the day. <laughs> and I think that's where the cost is, and that's where it's covering, which it's hard for people to see that with that word but i think yeah like i said it may be something that needs to be educated or explained because not everyone sees carnival the same way um as each other but i think there's more to it that needs to be um put forward or educated somehow you know yeah and i think there's lots of communities that can't understand what word carnival is because it's so sieved in to be very commercial than being community driven that's that's really helpful that, that yeah so the, the spend on carnival is far more than um a short period of time leading up yeah, to the and day and of people who never your, turn up in carnival yeah. they just do the work behind the scenes and they never show their face in carnival so carnival isn't everything it's the things that happen all behind that makes it great <laughs> the head councillor kennedy Yes, for us all to remember that uh, because of COVID, um, we missed uh, 20 and we missed 21, um, but the, the work was still funded and all that um, work in terms of preparing costumes, working together, talking about carnival and what it might mean for your community to um, build a costume, display um, music um, and design from your community. All that happened um, and you know, ways were found to uh, show and display that work um, uh, online and in virtual events. Thank you. We're going to have to wind up soon. I just have a question in terms, I think, possibly for our service providers <clears throat> who are still with us. With um, more organisations receiving less in funding on an ongoing basis, not through any fault of the authority, but just that's the kind of financial situation affecting most public sector organisations at the moment. I'm just trying to understand the challenges you now each face. And within that, what support is provided by the council to help you navigate the funded landscapes and alternative streams of funding, if necessary? Debbie wants to take that one first. Um, I, can, I can go if you like. Please do. Um, yeah, so it, it is um, a, a struggle right now. I think that the main thing that uh, Hackney showed, we're in a, um, a position where we are always trying to get a multi-year funding. Basically, multi-year funding is the like pot of gold for any small, <laughs> for any organization, but it, it allows you to have more stability. And so I think that but what we're in, more of a situation of now is having to constantly be funding year by year uh, where we have a little bit of funding that's multi-year that can be a, a sort of a base but that we're we're every year constantly trying to cover a huge amount of what our expected uh income needs to be in order to deliver the, the services that we do deliver um, and it, it just puts a lot of extra stress on um uh myself and whoever's doing the fundraising at that particular time because you are consistently on the edge of planning but also not knowing if uh services are are going to be available um and at what point how and how to scale back if you need to because like like we were talking about earlier what we don't want to do as an organization is scale back access so it's about then it's going to be scaling back the number of participants that we can uh, that we can serve because if we, if we have less people to support, then we we have to have less people as opposed to less people that have access requirements. Um, 
So um, in terms of support from the council, we have received uh, support from the council um, when we didn't receive council funding this last year for the first time in a long time. And we worked with actually Lucy and um, uh, Petra worked with me on support securing a little bit of uh, money so that we could um, hire a funding consultant to do some work with us on setting together a strategic plan fundraising plan over the next uh, for the next couple of years um, and so we were able to hire someone that could work with us to um, create uh, a bid and also um, kind of put out and do the research for us on which uh, organizations and trusts and grants we were able to um, uh, that we aligned with. Uh, so it, it gave a little bit of um, relief in a time when we were trying to scramble to get more funding. So that was something that the council has done for Hackney Shed in the last in the last year anyway. Thank you very much, Ricky. Um, I think this one's probably more for I want to make this final one, so you have to allow me that. Um, I think it's just a respect of the earlier discussion with regard to representations within the arts in Hackney, and we were speaking about activities at the museum. I, I would just like to understand how much of what we do is driven by the voice of respective communities, as opposed to a top-down approach in terms of telling us this is what, this is how we should be representing these communities. Yeah. So uh, the voice is any kind of consultation undertaken. Do we? I mean, if somebody writes the letter and has a suggestion, an independent person, not not aligned with any organisation at all, would that voice have any clout in terms of what we do? Because you know, it could spark an idea which could lead to something amazing. And I'd just like to know that every community out there has scope to be represented in some shape or form within what we're doing as a, as a local authority. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Um, we have um, lots and lots of correspondence coming into our email inboxes um, from all sorts of people all over the borough and outside the borough with great ideas for um, projects and events. And we do our best to um, support them and um, uh, encourage them, uh, signpost them to funding sources and, um, you know, where relevant we can build them into our programmes of, of activity that we've got planned and that we have funding for. So, for instance, Black History Month, um, you know, we're quite often contacted by organisations who have a great idea for that and they become part of our programme in addition to the programme that's being planned in the museum and libraries. Um, and um, I know that so, for instance, with the museum, I know for every project that they do that's, a, that's focusing on um, a particular community, they will build a steering group of um, representative people to guide, help guide them uh, to, to develop a, a show or a project that's, that's you know, really sort of relevant and um, uh, meaningful for that community. Uh, that's absolutely part of their practice. And you know it, it's it's um, really inspiring to hear them talk about how they've developed um, any given exhibition actually. Uh, so yeah, that that's that's a practice that you know is embedded in their work, and as much as we can in our work, we do that as well. Thank you very much, Lucy. We are going to have to end it there. I'm very very sorry. But I hope um, both um, Councillor Kennedy and yourself, and possibly Polly, would, if we need to. Um, put further questions to you, be open to responding them because we do have a load more, but unfortunately, time slipped away with them. Likewise, with the groups who are represented here today, um, we may need that kind of same communication with you just in terms of further understanding your current experience, just to feed into how we approach this piece of work. Um, that being said, I would like to thank each of you for attending today Councillor Kennedy, Holly Chuck, Lucy McMenemy, McMen. Emmy, yes, I've got that right. Catherine Mengarden from Play Space, Vicky Hambly from Hackney Shed, Jumbo Generations, Cindy Mann and Tan Long. Thank you very, very much. Likewise, Hackney Empire for the brief interlude they provided us with. Um, so that's the end of this agenda item. Thank you. Not the end of the meeting, I'm so sorry. Um,
But I'm hoping we have this sort of kind of general insight into the approach within our authority in respect of funding, the diversity or the way in which that's applied in terms of funding. I am hoping you've got, I hope you've got a gist or a sense of that. As I said, we'll be happy, happy to kind of submit any more questions to them and they're happy to take them. Um, yeah. So moving on, agenda item five, um, minutes of the last meeting. The draft minutes of the previous meeting held on the 23rd of January are included within the agenda pack for members to note and agree. I did have a couple of amendments I was meant to send Craig and I forgot, but um, they are quite quick. So 4.85 was actually you, Chair, you asked that question. It was a, it was a follow-up to mine, but it was from you. Right. Um, and I didn't know if my clarity of my question at 4.118, that sounds like quite a high number. I copied these into my notes, so I don't know if that's correct. Um, but I don't know, you know, I asked about the seven out of 30 um, strip searches that had been done without an appropriate adult. And I just don't know if that's, I don't know what that 23.3 number is, but I don't know if we could change it to that. And then I think they committed to, did they commit to coming back or did they commit to providing, what did they commit so, to something at the end? Okay, yeah. I think if we can just, in, yeah, include that. Sorry, I was meant to send them before. Okay, thank you very much. Subject to those amendments, can we agree the minutes, please? Thank you. We're listing the agenda item six, living in work, living in Hackney work program for the remainder of the year is attached. Um, two additional items have been included since the last meeting. That's cabinet question time and the accountability of the private rented sector and housing associations. Essentially, it's the PRS team. Councillor Semba Wema will be attending to kind of provide insight into the development of the work that's been doing and how it's going to be moving forwards um, in respect of the various areas it oversees. And Councillor Gordon, Mayor on, yes, go on. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good idea yes we can see it's because we've already submitted but we we can, we can certainly yeah, ask. yeah yeah all i will say i think i think i think the only issue with adding that on to temporary accommodation is that it's quite a large subject. Um, I'm not entirely sure we'd be able to give it justice during that discussion. Um, it may be something that the chair and I have to go away and think about how we um, can add that into the work programme. Yeah. We could look at it separately, we could do it as a written submission, or it could be moved over to the next, um, next municipal year's work programme. Is there a, did you say there was a date for the question, is the question time in the same meeting on the 22nd? Yeah. Oh, it's the same meeting. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. It's the same meeting, sorry. And then we've got the special joint follow-up meeting on the outcomes of Child Q Safeguarding Practice Review, 28th of March. Um, we still haven't, well, we're not expecting the IOPC report to be with us by that stage. Um, however, we can still kind of analyse and review whatever we're presenting, officers will be present. So there's still scope to kind of assess whatever we're presenting, any information we're presented with um, as far as we possibly can. Get to item seven, any other business? Is there any other business? I formally declare this meeting closed. Thank you very much. I'm assuming there wasn't, I had to look around. No, no, no. Thank you very much.